to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I'm your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this podcast and every other podcast I do by going to PorkinsPolicyReview.com. Well, today we are joined uh, by a very special guest, and uh, um, we were talking uh, before in our emails, and, and I was telling him that we actually uh, sort of broke protocol here at the podcast, and we're having on a guest to discuss a recent book that he wrote, and I've actually not had a chance to read the book yet, which, as I said, was uh, a little unusual for the podcast, but I was so impressed with his uh, uh, recent appearance he had on uh, the Opperman Report with our good friend Ed Opperman, and uh, and I wanted to have him on to discuss this book because I think it's very important. And our guest, uh, and I'll, I'll get to his name right now, is, of course, Casey Gaines McCullough, and uh, he is a writer. Uh, you can find his work on a n- number of different uh, outlets, uh, including uh, the Huffington Post. Uh, he's done uh, quite a bit for News One. And, of course, we'll link up to all of this. But he is also the author of a book which has just come out. And it is uh, something that I am uh, definitely going to uh, get my hands on very soon. And that is, of course, Inside the CIA's Secret War in Jamaica. But anyway, Casey Gay McCullough, uh, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for having me, Pierce. And uh, yeah, thanks for thanks to Ed Opperman, a, a great guy who's gotten me good exposure and helped me reach out to people like you. So yeah, I really appreciate your time and chance to kind of um, promote my book and a lot of the history of Jamaica that a lot of people don't know that has been going on for some time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, again, I've, I've been very interested in um, the sort of geopolitics of Jamaica. Uh, it is, uh, you know, I, you're you, you're in uh, New York as well, right? Yeah, New yeah. Jersey, but and I've been you know, most of the time big, in New York. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's a big Jamaican population here in New York, uh, and it is a uh, you know it's a very it's very close to America. Obviously, the the you know linguistically, it's an English speaking. Uh, country in the Caribbean. So there's a lot of uh, reason to pay attention to Jamaica. But uh, Casey, why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about why you decided to write a book uh, about the uh, the CIA's sort of secret war in Jamaica and their sort of, um, I don't know, uh, sort of controlling of uh, politics in Jamaica and all the sort of things like that. I know uh, that you, um, uh, I believe it was like a thesis you, you wrote about uh, in college that was sort of related to this. But give us a little bit of background as to why you decided to write the book. Okay, well, um, so my father's from Jamaica, so I've been traveling Jamaica for a long time, you know, ever since I was in two, three, four, five years old. And I've always loved going there. And I'd always be intrigued by the, the politics there. And, you know, my family would talk about politics, and I would see all this graffiti, which would be PNP and JLP, and this graffiti would be written everywhere. And I'd, I'd be kind of impressed. I'd be like, wow, I never hmm. see any graffiti that says Democrat or Republican in the United States. <laughs> but here, here you have all these graffiti. And I, I thought it was, you know, people passionate about their politics. But there's a um, kind of deep connection between um, politics and kind of uh, gangs in Jamaica, political based gangs that I didn't know about then. And then eventually I became like a big Bob Marley fan. So and I would try and find out like what was the meaning behind all his different songs and why is he saying he doesn't work for the CIA and why is he talking about ambush in the night? Like he's talking about he, how he got shot and how it's the system. And then he, mm. you know, so, um, I went to the Bob Marley museum in Jamaica and they took me on a tour and they took me around back to a whole rehearsal space and they showed me these bullet holes and they said, Hey, this is where the CIA tried to have Bob Marley killed. And I was, you know, I was like, why would the CIA try and kill Bob Marley? 
And uh, so that's what the tour guide said. And then I would read a book from my grandmother called uh, Marley and Me by Don Taylor, who was Bob Marley's manager. And in that book, he would say um, that they actually caught some of the people who tried to shoot Bob, who tried to kill Bob Marley at shot him and, you know, shot Don Taylor. And they had them in a court, of, kind of ghetto court. And under interrogation, some of the, the shooters admitted that the CIA paid them in guns and cocaine to try and assassinate Bob Marley. And this was in Don Taylor's book. So I kept up my interest in this. And like you said, yeah, I went to Columbia University. And for my big se- senior thesis, I wrote a story about how kind of Jamaica was caught in the middle of the Cold War and the crossfires and how Bob Marley kind of helped a a peace treaty between the two opposing gangs from the PNP, who is the People's National Party, who were the more progressive left-leaning party at the time with Michael Manley, who had ties to uh, Fidel Castro, had a lot of progressive ideas. And it's kind of funny, he labeled himself a democratic socialist. Which was a horrid idea to the American <laughs> government, and now we have a democratic socialist running for president and doing yes. pretty good. So I, I wrote that paper, and then yeah, I wanted being a journalist for News One, and then there was um, the son of one of the uh, JLP, Jamaica Labor Party. That was the uh, political party which was closer to the United States and was anti-communist. The son of one of the the gangsters from the JLP, the Shower Posse, he had a son called uh, Duddis, Christopher Duddis Coke. He was extradited to the state. So I did a kind of a big story about how Duddis was almost a creation of the CIA. So I did a little little bit of research on it for a story for News One in 2010. And that was how the CIA created the Jamaican Shower Posse. And that story went viral. A lot of Jamaicans liked it. A lot of... um, I'm not going to use the term conspiracy theorist because I, because we I don't believe in theories and I know a lot of other people who do research uh, don't believe in theories we believe in facts and evidence and history and I'm not going to use the term alternative historian because there's one history and there's you know propaganda that's out there so uh, but I would say maybe alternative media types mm-hmm. people not in the mainstream media who are actually willing to scrutinize the government uh, at a higher level of scrutiny than than the mainstream media would. So um, then um, I had a friend, Paul Stewart, and uh, he, he launched a book company, Over the Edge Books, and he was a fan of my uh, writing in News 1 and other places. He said, why don't you write a book? And he said, what would you want to write a book on? And I said, uh, Inside the CIA Secret War in Jamaica, because of the, the popularity of the story. And um, I actually kept on you know, following up doing evidence, and then you know, WikiLeaks released the Kissinger cables. So there were thousands of cables dealing with Jamaica in this, specifically the year 1976, which is also the year of my, my, my birth. So there were thousands of cables. So I had all sorts of research material to kind of um, write the book on. And no one else had kind of told the story. Like there's been a lot of Bob Marley biographies, which kind of go into it a little bit. And then there's been some stories about the the shower posse. And then uh, Laurie Gunst, who is a a white woman who traveled to Jamaica, she kind of wrote a story about the political violence and gangs in Jamaica. But And she touched on the CIA, but she didn't really go into uh, a lot of length on the CIA's actual involvement. So that's how I kind of got into it. And uh, Casey, why don't, you, why don't you give us a, let's get into a little bit of the context. Because again, I think, um, uh, I don't know how many people are really quite aware of what was going on in Jamaica in the 70s. Um, and the way that it, it uh, you know, it seems like a country that uh, is is sort of... You know, unfortunately, it's just sort of synonymous with reggae and weed and things like that. And people don't really understand that. So, you know, this is a real country with uh, all sorts of different things going on. uh, And they just sort of see the uh, like headlines. Oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. But there's a lot more uh, that uh, is linked between Jamaica and the United States, which, again, people obviously know that it was a British colony. And I think that is sort of. Again, people link it with England, but the um, get a little bit into about the political situation during the 1970s. This uh, because Jamaica was a, a sort of battleground for Cold War politics, and right. uh, explain that a little bit. And again, talk about um, you know we have Michael Manley with the People's National Party, uh, who was uh, Prime Minister of Jamaica from 72 to 1980. And uh, and then we also yeah. we have um, Edward Siaga, who's a really fascinating character, and he was head of the Jamaican Labor Party, and he came into power. Um, he, he defeated Manley in 1980. Explain a little bit about these two um, political parties, how they are structured during the 1970s, and how 
the violence and the stuff that we see going on in Jamaica today, again, is sort of directly goes back to what was going on in the 1970s. Yeah, definitely. So um, in 1972, Michael Manley was uh, elected prime minister of Jamaica. His father was Norman Manley, who was, I think, a premier of Jamaica before. But I think the Jamaica Labor Party was running Jamaica pretty much since independence. Jamaica became independent from England in 1962. But 10 years later, Michael Manley came in in the 70s, and he was kind of inspired by the Black Power movement. He was kind of inspired by the anti-colonial movement that was happening in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. So, as I said before, uh, as we know, America has a uh, has had a long-standing war against Cuba, which has been fought on many fronts, including terrorism, economics, propaganda. And Michael Manley developed a friendship with Fidel Castro, which really angered the United States. <laughs> and so from 1974, some of these anti-Castro Cubans who have were kind of Bay of Pig veterans and CIA-trained uh, assassins and terrorists. They began launching a campaign against Manly in 1974 when they started bombing the Cuban embassy. So they bombed it twice in 1974. In 1976, Henry Kissinger came to Jamaica, and he wanted to talk to Michael Manley about a few issues. One was bauxite. That's Jamaica's biggest natural resource. So bauxite is, is used to make aluminum. The other thing he wanted to talk about was his support of Fidel Castro's troops in Angola. So there was a, a progressive force in Angola that was fighting the, anti, the apartheid South African mercenaries who were uh, more on the right wing. They were supported by the U.S. And then Fidel Castro was supporting the left wing progressive black um, party. I believe it was the MPLA. So Kissinger came and he asked Michael Manley to withdraw his support for Castro's troops in Angola. And Michael Manley, being a very principled anti-apartheid person, said he would not. And he actually welcomed the MPLA to Jamaica, and he recognized them. So this uh, angered Kissinger, and Kissinger began uh, a campaign against Jamaica, which was fought on many levels. Again, just like they were kind of doing to Cuba, you had your economic sabotage, you had your propaganda, and then you also had a, a level of terrorism and political violence in Jamaica. So in 1972, I think there might have been like, you know, there was always been violent clashes for elections. And it, this happens in developing countries. But in 1976, what happened was the violence almost tripled and there was uh, hundreds, if not thousands of guns being shipped into Jamaica from America to fight these battles. And also the, some of these Cuban terrorists, again, who were you know bombing the Cuban embassy in 1974, came back to Jamaica. One of these guys was uh, Luis Posada Carias, who's a notorious uh, gangster, terrorist, assassin, who mm. also was on the CIA's payroll for most of his life. And he also participated in Iran-Contra. So the political element was, I think, that once Michael Manley chose to ally himself a bit with Castro, and it wasn't just Castro. I mean, he was friends with uh, the Prime Minister of Canada, Prime Minister of Sweden, and his policies were not that different from, you know, democratic socialist countries in Europe. But the fact that America was really fighting uh, a, a Cold War where every country was like a, a, a piece on a chessboard. So they, you know, you, you, they wanted to, especially, yeah, Jamaica is an English-speaking country. It's, you know, 90 miles away from Cuba and maybe 200 miles away from the United States. So it's very close to the United States. And America kind of took over England's role when it went to, from colonialism to neocolonialism in terms of economic dependence and cultural influence, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So, out, so, see, so once Manly allied himself with Cuba, Siaga uh, allied himself with the right wing in the United States, which included the CIA, Kissinger, Bush, Reagan. And those guys. And um, so in 1976, actually, George H.W. Bush was the uh, head of the CIA. And uh, I think Ted Shackley, who was another infamous CIA uh, terrorist, uh, <laughs> pretty just a round, all, round, all round shady character, was, was George Bush's number two. So Jamaica became caught in the crossfire. Um, Michael Manley was actually a very, very smart and cunning person, and he actually infiltrated the CIA with a spy of his own. So he had a he sent a spy to this American embassy to 
seek out the CIA, and this guy kind of infiltrated the CIA and the JLP. And once Michael Manley found out a lot of information that there was actually a, a, a plot against them for a, a kind of coup d'etat, he had, he had a state of emergency in Jamaica where a lot of the, the, the JLP plotters were locked up. And this was the election year of, of, of 1976. For people that don't know much about Michael Manley, I, I really would suggest, uh, you know, checking out some of his writing and, and even just videos of him because he talks about, uh, you know, it, it, it's very, it's very, uh, I don't know, like in vogue within the alternative media to talk about color revolutions. Manley was talking about all of this sort of stuff back in the 1970s. He was very explicit about um, how the CIA was coming into Jamaica, how they were using economic warfare. Um, you know, they, they uh, uh, suspended the IMF loans. Maybe we could talk about that a little bit as well. But he he really and he again, he talks about um, I was watching a video of him the other day and he was uh, straight out of uh, all the sort of stuff that's talked about in the alternative media about political parties sort of coming out of nowhere, getting a ton of money from some outside source, and then they get, you know, they, they control newspapers. And he really was very much aware of what was going on in Jamaica. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah. So actually, right after Kissinger came, there was actually an IMF meeting in Jamaica. So this is maybe a week after. And so when the IMF came, there was actually a number of acts of terrorism, car bombings, two Jamaican police officers were killed, and a lot of political violence happened. And so after this, you almost had a propaganda campaign. James Reston, who was a New York Times reporter, who was also closely linked to the CIA and Operation Mockingbird, Cord Meyer, etc., wrote a very negative Peace in the New York Times right after the IMF things. And, of course, Jamaica is very dependent not only on American business, but also tourism in general. So by uh, launching a propaganda campaign against Jamaica, not only from the, the, the Gleaner, which is Jamaica's paper, which was had close ties to the CIA, but also from, you know, the New York Times, Washington Post, and the kind of big papers kind of writing about Jamaica like it wasn't a good place to visit or a good place to do business. Mm. And they, they would and they would do things like they would orchestrate like shootings at like uh, you know if James Reston or a big time journalist was was at a resort they'd have gunmen come in and shoot you know shoot around not kill anybody but yeah. scare them enough so that then they go back home and they write these terrible oh Jamaica is this violent awful place and you know even the resorts are not aren't safe and then suddenly you know nobody goes there on uh, you know for vacation during the summer. Right, exactly. And again, it's a very dependent on tourism. And actually, I think what happened, too, was that one of Michael Manley's spies actually went to New York and met with James Reston and, and, and fed him this uh, tall tale about how he was trained in Cuba to, with guns mm. to, to fight against the the JLP. And, you know, <laughs> there was a possible uh, Cuban takeover. So, and a lot of these... Um, Right wing force was also very closely tied to the the drug trade, and Michael Manley had another spy in Miami who was working with some of these anti Castro Cubans to 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 plot terrorism in Jamaica. And you know, Michael Manley again, very cunning, resourceful guy, actually uh, managed to stop a big terrorist attack in in July through his own personal spies. And he actually, there was a, um, there was a, an act of terrorism at the airport in 1976 in Jamaica in in, in early July, where a, a bomb went off on a Cuban plane that was flying from Kingston to Havana. Luckily for the people on the plane, the plane was delayed, and it just blew up some luggage. If the plane was on time, everyone on the flight would have been killed. So Michael Manley actually fed the right information to the U.S. government on who was behind these crimes, and the U.S. government did nothing about it. <laughs> yeah. And then later in October, the same terrorist bombed a plane coming from another Caribbean island, Barbados, and it was, uh, again, a, the same Cuban plane, and it wound up killing 73 people. And these same people responsible for this terrorist attack, all very closely tied to the CIA, Luis Posada Carrias, Orlando Bosch. Guys like Frank Castro. These guys also went on to kill um, Orlando Letelier, who was the former Chilean ambassador to America. And they actually killed him on Embassy Row. They blew up his car. It was, it was the scene that inspired Scarface. So when Scarface was... Right, right. Yeah. 
So these same Cuban terrorists who were terrorizing Jamaica, terrorizing Mexico, they were just launching any any anybody who would do business with Cuba or make friends with Castro was a target for terrorism, assassinations, kidnapping. Mm. Well, and and I think uh, let's we'll, we'll move into the um, the the drug trade because that sort of is like the the next layer to what's going on uh, within Jamaica again being orchestrated by the CIA. But um, Casey, I just had a quick question for you, Edward Siaga. What is how is he viewed in Jamaica? Because I think you know anyone that's listening to this and if they Google him. He it looks. I mean, he is white. He's Lebanese and Scottish, I believe. Right. Is that just sort of? Uh, I mean, I know that within the Caribbean, and again, even in uh, Central and South America, I mean, there is a sort of, I don't know, a legacy of of voting in or electing either white or very light skinned people. Even in Cuba, of course, Castro is is. Uh, He's not black, obviously. Right. Um, I mean, again, that's 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 all over. I mean, in uh, in other uh, you know Caribbean countries, we we see the same thing. Obviously, I mean, what's his um, Evo Morales is sort of the the first um, indigenous person ever in Bolivia. In Bolivia. So, I mean, what is that? Just sort of part of the culture of um, you know? Is that just? I mean, I know like. Um, What's his name? Uh, who who we'll get to later? Bruce Golding is also very light skinned as well. Yeah, he is also, and the new the new president Andrew Holness, who just won, I believe it was January February. He's also um, lighter skinned. So what happened in Jamaica was when the English left, you still kind of had a color caste system, not really defined like you would have in India or South Africa, but a kind mm-hmm. of de facto color caste system and. The, the more privileged, lighter skin elite would be because it wasn't just um, Edward Siaga, who was, you know, white and no, light. No, no, it was no. also Michael Manley, who was actually part part African. I'm not sure if Edward Siaga is part African at all. But so you kind of had a, a caste system where the, the light skin, brown, mixed race mm. elite would take over from the British in terms of running the country. The interesting thing that they're saying about Siaga is. He's a very polarizing figure. So what what you had in Jamaica in the in the late '60s is that Edward Siaga created what you called a, a garrison, which was a kind of housing development called Tivoli Gardens. And in Tivoli Gardens, what he did was he used housing and jobs and his own influence to create this this community called Tivoli Gardens. So if you are from Tivoli Gardens, you admire, respect, and love Edward Siaga. They're, the soccer stadium is named after him. And he's not... He, he, I think one one reason he was such a popular politician is he's not only able to speak, you know, proper, respectable English. He went to Harvard. He was born in Boston. But he was also able to communicate with the black, poor, and working class. And he could speak Patois very well. And he was also involved in the reggae business. And he was very important. Right, right. Of great artists like Dennis Brown. So he he had the kind of touch. So if you were from if you were JLP, you would see him as someone who might be responsible for uh, getting you electricity, getting you food, getting you a job, getting your children into school. Like he would come into this to communities like Tivoli Gardens and he would buy the kids ice cream and take them to the movies. So what happened in Jamaica, which I wrote about in my book, I think in Africa, what you had with uh, post-colonial effect of that a lot of these um, countries like England or Spain or Portugal, whoever was doing the colonizing was, what they would do before they left or it, it went into independence is they would take the tribes and turn them into political parties. In Jamaica, it's kind of the opposite. They took the political parties and turned them into tribes. So it's almost like a... Uh, a tribeless loyalty for PNP, where it might not even be an ideological issue. It's just that your father was for this political party. Everyone in your neighborhood is from the, for this political party. So this political party provides you with health care, education, electricity. So you're going to be loyal to that political party, regardless if you're a democratic socialist, a capitalist, communist, whatever. Mm. It's not just based on ideology. It's all, it's, 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 Based on community, based on a, a, a kind of group loyalty. I was just going to say the Jamaican Labor Party is is not, uh, it, th- despite the name, it's quite uh, right wing. <laughs> quite right wing, and it wouldn't. I think kind of when Michael Manley split to the left, they kind of forced the way to the right. I mean, they were always a little um, right wing, and mm. they were. I think they would 
been um, a lot of pro-black people like H. Rap Brown and Stokely Carmichael from coming to Jamaica. And, you know, of course, you do, when you have such a powerful country like the United States and who's, you know, a, a right-wing country, you you don't want to anger them. So, but the political differences really, really started when Michael Manley really, he, he took the PNP and took them left. Mm. Right? That's, I think that's how he won the 72 election because mm. he didn't just, before it was kind of upper class practical party. His father was a lawyer. So, and also um, very closely tied to the trade unions in Jamaica. But when Manley went left, then Siaga was forced to go right, and that's when I think you know he 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 accepted the CIA's help, which it was I think is almost if you accept the help from the CIA, it's kind of like you make a deal with the devil. Like he <laughs> might have just thought it would be for his own personal power, but in um in working with the CIA, he created a cycle of violence and drugs and uh, dons. Usually, so in in in, com- in communities like Tivoli Gardens, they're kind of um isolated communities and the police might not even go in there and usually there's someone called a don which is like almost like don corleone who is the the mafia lord who kind of controls the area so it was before um before the drug trade exploded the the dons were had to be loyal to the the politicians because that's how they got their jobs that's how they got their housing that's how they they had their you know Mm -hmm. they kind of avoided the law but after the cocaine trade hit in Jamaica, the dons are actually more powerful than the politicians. So rather than the politicians kind of having the dons in their pocket, these kind of, you know, crime lords loyal to political parties, the the, the dons almost had the politicians in their pocket. Hmm. Yeah, and I know I, uh, I was listening to uh, an interview you did recently and you were talking about the uh, the very famous – concert that was organized by Bob Marley and Peter Tosh and others where they, they tried to, you know, there's a famous picture of, of uh, uh, Bob Marley holding uh, Manly and Siaga's hands together or something. Um, but what they don't show you and that you mentioned is that, you know, just before that, they're doing the same thing with different dons, you know, these like yeah. prime lords. I mean, that's how um, big they were. And again, I mean, they're they're there next to, you know, the prime minister and the leader of the opposition. They don't, you know, they, they're very much mixing in the same sort of circles. Definitely. And and it's it's really interesting because it was actually the, the dons who wanted the peace and not the politicians. So Bob Marley was a very unifying figure in Jamaica. So even though despite the fact he pretty much had knowledge I, that it was the JLP and the CIA that that tried to have him killed in 1976, but he was still loyal to some friends he had who did, who were with the Jamaica Labor Party, like Claudie Massip, who was um, Edward Siaga's kind of right-hand man in Tivoli Gardens. But he also had, was very close to uh, some people from the some of the gangsters on the People's National Party, the PNP, like Buck, Bucky Marshall, Tony Welsh, and another politician, uh, Anthony Spaulding, who, who had a lot of close ties to some of these Jamaican gangsters. So Bob Marley was a kind of unifying figure. So... It was actually, I think, Claudie Massip and Bucky Marshall found themselves in a prison cell together, and they were fed up with the cycle of violence that the politicians kind of helped start it. So they went to go see Bob Marley in England. He, he left Jamaica to go to England after he was uh, after he was shot out of you know fear for his life and you know also to to make money and, and tour and see the world. So they went to him, and then he came back in 1978. And this was organized by the the so-called gangsters the gangsters wanted peace the politicians didn't want peace and especially the cia and the jamaica labor party didn't want peace because if michael manley could bring peace to jamaica it might, would just extend his his power and 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 give him a chance to get reelected so the unfortunately the peace treaty did not last too long and i from what i've read in certain instances that even some of the equipment shipped to Jamaica for the uh, peace concert contained guns for the Jamaica Labor Party. And then, so two years after 1978, when Bob Marley kind of unified the country, you had one of the most, you had the most violent election in 1980, where uh, way, way more guns were coming in in 1980 from the CIA, from from my sources, that kind of escalated this election year in 1980 to the bloodiest one in Jamaica. And it's kind of, you know, remain so for election years for some time now. 
Mm. Well, and and uh, now 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 we're into sort of ni- the eighties, and this is again when the uh, cocaine trade really kind of flourishes. Obviously, uh, right. I mean, it, it existed before that in Jamaica uh, in the seventies to a degree, but uh, it seems as if you know, obviously the eighties was sort of the sort of you know decade of cocaine, um, and the the traffic was just sort of through the roof. Talk talk about this because I know you I know you discuss this in detail in your book uh, and it's it's interesting too again with uh, as, you know as with many sort of deep state operations a lot of right. the same people pop up over and over again so you know you, you mentioned Orlando Bosch who's kind of is like everywhere um, you know we have these sort of anti Castro Cubans involved in. Uh, you know, the, the JFK assassination, other political assassinations, Iran Contra, they're right. popping up in Jamaica. And, um, also, um, please do, uh, talk about Jeb Bush because, um, I know, you know, he has such a reputation as being so lame and boring. But, um, uh, I know that, uh, he was actually, again, um, pretty intimately linked with the cocaine trade in Jamaica. So talk about yeah, he, and Jeb Je, Je Bush was, was linked. There was a FBI agent by the name of Darlene Novinger mm. and she infiltrated an upper class J- Jamaican family called the Smat family. I believe it was William and Richard Smat and they were big time cocaine wholesalers out of Jamaica. And she said that these SMAP brothers would tell her that they had to, you know, pay Jeb Bush money to operate and that they even brought cocaine to the White House and, the, and then <laughs> that Jeb Bush was kind of the point man for a lot of these, um, the drug dealers in the Caribbean and Latin America in terms of, you know, Miami being the point of entry from where all of these drugs are coming in. And this fits into a lot of other stuff. Like I think Al Miller was saying Jeb Bush was quite involved in the cocaine trade. And I think Chip Tatum said that he was, uh, involved in moving drugs for Barry Seal. And I think it was Chip Tatum also said that it was uh, Jeb Bush who actually called the hit on Barry Seal. Barry Seal is another infamous Mm -hmm. CIA pilot, drug dealer tied to JFK, tied to uh, layouts and and heroin. And then, uh, yeah, if you see Narcos, the Netflix series is in Narcos. He, um, there's a, a, there's a movie on Barry Seal with, with, Tom Cruise coming out, and they had another one with um, Dennis Hopper. But Jeb was very closely tied to the uh, the Cali cartel, and um, yeah, and his father, of course, too, was the CIA. So I, a lot of and Felix Rodriguez, who was very close with both Orlando Bosch and Jeb Bush, was also very deeply involved in the kind of Iran Contra cocaine era. I think he was supposedly tried to um, bribe. Another another uh, Rodriguez, no relation, Ramon Millian Rodriguez, who actually testified at the Kerry Committee, and he actually testified that Felix Rodriguez offered him two million dollars to, to in order to have um, the Cali cartel support the Contras. And if you read um, Terry Reed's book along with um, John right. Cummings, he places. Felix Rodriguez at the center of the drug trade, not only coming out of El Salvador, where he was based with Luis Posada. Luis Posada went to jail for the the murder of the 73 people in the plains. And then the CIA broke him out of jail and he immediately began working for Felix Rodriguez again in El Salvador. But at the same time, Felix Rodriguez was also involved in Mena, Arkansas with the Clinton family, with (laughs) Barry Seal, with a number of other CIA operatives and Clinton family friends like Dan Lassiter mm. and Clinton's brother, Roger Clinton, and moving this cocaine from me to Arkansas, all which would then it would circulate all around the country. So I think a lot like if people read Gary Webb's book, you kind of see how the West Coast was affected by the Iran Contra cocaine and it helped kind of spawn the, the crack epidemic on the West Coast. And then if you look at what was going on in Jamaica, there was a New York Times article saying that the Jamaican gangs in the 80s controlled 40% of the crack market. So, and, and if all, there are several um, people who came from Edward Siaga's JLP, Jamaican Shower Posse gang, who would later admit to being trained and working with the CIA. One of these people was Cecil Connor. And Cecil Connor was actually originally from St. Kitts, but he, another small uh, Caribbean island, but mm. moved to Jamaica, started working with the JLP, fighting against Michael Manley's forces. And he said that the CIA broke him out of jail, trained him how to kill people with a watch, trained him how to commit acts of terrorism, trained him how to kill. 
And also, he became a big player in the drug trade along with Lester Jim Brown Coke and Vivian Blake. And these guys were kind of the central figures of the Jamaican shower posse Mm. who controlled a lot of the drug trade from Miami all the way up to New York City to Washington, D.C. to Rochester, all along the East Coast. And these guys were very closely tied to the CIA. There was another uh, shower posse member, Richard Storyteller Morrison. Storyteller was his nickname. Richard Morrison was his name. And he would tell a cellmate that the CIA all but moved the cocaine for him from (laughs) Columbia to Jamaica to Miami in the 80s because the JLP and Edward Siago, who was president or prime minister of Jamaica at the time, was very helpful to America in their war and invasion in Grenada. So a lot of these J- Jamaicans who got involved with the drug trade were also very closely tied to the CIA, just like a lot of these Cubans who were mm. narco terrorists, like Luis Posada Carias, who uh, was a you know he was not only was he a, a terrorist and assassin, but he was also involved in the drug trade very heavily in Venezuela, where he was based. And wasn't he like pardoned by Jeb Bush, or am I confusing him? Orlando with- Bosch was Orlando pardoned Bosch, by Jeb yeah. Bush. Yeah. Right. Well, actually, Jeb Bush arranged it so that his father pardoned him because i think it was in 1990 so despite you know killing these 73 people being responsible for the assassination of an american uh, citizen and a chilean diplomat in (laughs) right on embassy row this was you know right in the center of everything just despite being responsible for hundreds at least 100 murders and acts of terrorism he was pardoned by george bush with the help of jeb bush and uh and another um kind of right-wing cuban congressman Congresswoman, actually, Ileana Rothstein. I, I can't remember her name exactly, but Jeb was very influential in having um, Orlando Bosch pardoned. And George W. Bush was quite influential in having Louis Posada pardoned. So Louis Posada right now is a free man living in Miami, yeah. plotting against Venezuela. <laughs> and he has been responsible. And I think, he, I think they busted him out of Panama, too, because they busted him in Panama for trying to kill Castro. He plotted, uh, he killed an Italian citizen who was a tourist in um, in Cuba, responsible for dozens, if not more than 100 innocent lives being uh, killed and being involved in the drug trade. And But these guys are kind of like the, the criminal element of the CIA. And a lot of these kind of Bay of Pigs, Brigade 2506 characters have had such a big role, especially in Iran-Contra, with the cocaine being um, sold to kind of fund the Contras. Mm, in mm. Nicaragua. And a lot of these uh, anti-Castro Cubans, Brigade 2506, Alpha 66, Antonio Vesiano, who just recently admitted to being part of a CIA plot to kill Kennedy, was a, another figure who was also involved in the, in the, in the drug trade. He got caught with a, a good amount of cocaine. Mm. And then he was shot in the head right before the, um, right. the HCSA hearings on... Right. Um, on the Kennedy assassination. <laughs> Just, yeah, <laughs> that's how that uh, happens. Um, let's, let's, let's get into uh, a bit about the shower posse because this is, uh, they are obviously, they, they sort of come into their own in the 1980s when Siaga oh. comes into power uh, <laughs> and they're very much, uh, you know, his sort of, I guess, m- you know, militia, um, Within and they're they're based again within Tivoli Gardens, uh, which is the sort of again you, you were talking about the loyalty that Tivoli Gardens has to Siaga and to the JLP. But talk about that because that's sort of again people might you know remember, but we're, we're coming up on the sixth anniversary of the 2010 uh, Tivoli incursion, uh, which was a pretty you know pretty wild time. This is like a month long. Uh, pitched battle between the ostensibly the Jamaican government and the shower posse. And they were trying to extradite um, the founder uh, of the shower posse, his son, uh, uh, Christopher Koch. Uh, yeah, Christopher Dennis Koch. Yeah. So talk, talk a little bit about the, the shower posse. And, and again, and then, and then maybe we'll, we'll get into what was going on in 2010, because I think that's interesting um, uh, for a number of reasons. But explain a little bit uh, about the shower posse. Well, um, the, the the shower posse emerged from Tivoli Gardens, which was Edward Siaga's stronghold, and you know they kind of served as his personal militia. A lot of them got their their starts in the election year of 1976, like uh, Jim Brown, 
So mm. Jim Brown is Christopher Koch's father. He was named after the American football player Jim Brown, not because he played football, but because Jim Brown was in all these kind of, you know, cowboy and gangster movies, and he was this big, tough gun gunman. Mm. So um, Lester Lloyd Koch took on Jim Brown as a kind of nickname, and that became his uh, his name. That's what people, most people would be known as. And so, again, like, to the people in the communities, like Tivoli Gardens, Jim Brown would be a hero. They would throw dances in his honor. They would, you know, pay, they, they have murals of him mm-hmm. because he was a protector of their community. But for other communities who weren't allied to the JLP, like Remo, where they said he was responsible for, you know, 20 murders, or, or, or Arnett Gardens, where he would, you know, kind of have a kind of reign of terror, or even Miami by all accounts, he killed a pregnant crackhead and, you know, five other people in a Miami crack house because they tried to rob him of his jewelry. But this guy, just despite all of this, he was Edward Siaga's bodyguard. <laughs> and Edward Siaga led the, profession, the the procession of his funeral. And when he was interviewed, the Jamaican TV says, why are you why are you this guy's funeral? And he goes, well, he's a protector of the community and the community respects him. And he didn't get into all the fact that this guy was a big time murderer drug dealer, terrorist. He kind of emerged after Claudie Ma- So Claudie Massip was Bob Marley's friend. And I have from a lot of different sources that it was actually Jim Brown who was part of the assassination attempt on Bob Marley's life. And that's what kind of allowed him to rise in power in the shower posse. The, the fact that he would have the cojones to try and shoot Bob Marley. <laughs> and the, the fact, I think, that the CIA was, you know, respected it too. And, um, so for the 1980 election, there would be a kind of um, like a guns for drugs pipeline. So the, the cocaine would come into Jamaica. From Jamaica, the cocaine would go to Miami. And then the Jamaicans would come back with guns from Miami to fight the wars in or the, in, in, in the inner cities of, of Jamaica to strengthen their power base. So Jim Brown was a very, very uh, bad, tough, murdering, drug dealing character but to many people he was still a hero and again i I talked a little bit about cecil connor who was his ally who admitted to being trained by the cia and then there was vivian blake who was kind of seen as the brains behind the operation who was in charge of the the business level of of distributing the cocaine from miami to new york to rochester to dc to boston all the way to texas so the shower posse I think benefited from a lot of the political protection, not only from Jamaica, but also the CIA. When there was a, um, when they had the, the Kerry committee hearings on Iran Contra, there was a, a drug dealer by the name of Mike Vogel. And he actually would say that Siago was not only responsible for, uh, Jamaica being kind of like a free drug zone for whoever could pay off the politicians but also for a lot of the money laundering that goes on in the Cayman Islands. And the Jamaican Labor Party and Edward Siaga have also always been very closely tied to the Cayman Islands, which is you know notorious for its um, sure. money laundering we see in Panama. So what happened in the 80s is a lot of these Jamaicans, both on both sides, from the People's National Party and from the Jamaica Labor Party, they would expand their base to the United States. The the Jamaican Labor Party. So once once the Jamaican Labor Party was in power, that means they had the ability to get passports for all for whoever they wanted to travel to the United States. So they were able to send out teams who could not only control the importation, but also the distribution and the muscle for the cocaine trade going all up and down the East Coast. And you already had heavy Jamaican bases in Miami, in New York. To a lesser extent, uh, Washington, D.C., and Boston. So it it, it, it went from a, a local militia in a small garrison in Kingston to an international drug gang with also bases in Toronto. There's a lot of Jamaicans in Toronto. So the, the, the drugs, the shower pots expanded to Toronto. And also some of the drug gangs also expanded to England. Of course, England has always had a lot of close ties to Jamaica. So... In the 80s, these kind of the shower posse and also the, the Spangler posse, who was the PNP's kind of answer to the, the shower posse, <laughs> they would kind of expand from Jamaica to all over the world, especially English speaking countries like Canada, United States and um, England. So and and uh, it, it's, it's kind of hard to say exactly because you, you didn't you don't have like a, a bland dome like you had for the um, for Gary Webb's book where you had one, you know, CIA cocaine person who was definitely the connect he was definitely the guy you know giving freeway ricky ross the cocaine 
But right. I, I think it, 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 what you had was more of a direct link in that the CIA supported gangsters from Jamaica were not only the importers, but they were also distributing the cocaine all over uh, America, which helped, you know, start the crack epidemic from, you know, cocaine now coming from the Caribbean and Central America all the way through Miami, which, you know, turned Miami into a war zone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cocaine yeah, absolutely. cowboys era. Well, um, briefly, um, let's talk a little bit about what was going on in 2010 in Tivoli Gardens. Um, as I mentioned before, this was uh, a pitched battle that lasted about a month. This was all because uh, the prime minister at the time, who was in the Jamaican Labor Party, Bruce Golding, refused at first to sign an extradition order right. uh, for Christopher Koch. Now, um, I guess I just wanted to get your take on this, Casey, because it, at the time, Christopher Koch was portrayed in much the same way that Noriega or Pablo Escobar or uh, we mentioned, you know, Ricky Ross, El Chapo. Uh, Christopher Koch was like the most, you know, evil drug trafficker on the planet. Uh, and, and he had to be taken care of. And, you know, if we, you know, if he's extradited, then, oh, it's a, a big win for the drug war. And, you know, suddenly everything will be wonderful again and no more cocaine will, will come into the U.S. You know, that's the sort of, uh, impression that we got here in, in the U.S. about this. But it really does look very much like the CIA kind of cleaning up shop in Jamaica, um, in, in terms, and again, 2010, this is when the sort of drug war in Mexico reaches whole new levels. Exactly. And we see the shift away from the Caribbean as a transshipment point, and we see Mexico becoming the major transshipment point for cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, weed, all sorts of different things. So talk about uh, a little bit about uh, Christopher Koch's extradition and, and, and what, was, what your take on all of that is. Yeah, I got to um, look at his extradition papers. Uh, maybe like 2009, a friend of mine got a hold of them, and it was it didn't it, it was obviously you know incriminating evidence uh, of him being involved in you know, marijuana, cocaine, not 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 large amounts, and also uh, s- some murders. So it's it's really interesting to me of why they went after him and the the, the, the level, because not only did America extradite him, Jamaica did not want to extradite him. Bruce mm-hmm. Golding, who I actually, I was actually sitting right there. There was an English gentleman who I met. I was in Jamaica last month. And um, so I met someone who read my book and he really liked the book. So he wanted to talk to me about the books. So we went to the Pegasus Hotel and, and, and you know, we were talking about my book. And then right there, sitting next to us, walks in is Bruce Golding. Oh, really? <laughs> Oh my we're God. talking about, <laughs> but, but so Bruce Golding, kind of like Edward C. He, Bruce Golding was part of the Jamaica Labor Party, the same party as Edward Siaga, and just like um, Edward Siaga had a relationship with Lester Lloyd Coke, Jim Brown, Bruce Golding had a relationship with Christopher Duddis Coke. So it was a kind of relationship where, of course, Tilly Gardens is heavily JLP. That's like everyone in that whole area votes for the Jamaica Labor Party. And so whoever the dawn of that area is, is very important to the JLP. And again, which you, you have a lot in a lot of, um, you know, third world countries where the drug trade brings in so much money. You, see, you have a, a, a high level of corruption among uh, government officials and a, almost a, a tolerance of, of, of the drug trade. Because it's as the kind of number one import export to a lot of countries. So uh, Bruce Golding did uh, didn't did not want to um, extradite uh, Christopher Dudas Coke, and he actually hired a lobbyist. <laughs> yes, yes, right. So I think he hired a lobbyist to kind of go to America and prevent the extradition of his his friend, who he would meet with, and you know they would you know, they had some sort of relationship. Unfortunately, this didn't work, and so. The U.S. demanded the extradition, and Jamaica is in no real position to fight the U.S. No. <laughs> no, no, no. So there was a massive surge of, of Tivoli Gardens and a massive invasion by the Jamaican military with American assistance. Homeland Security was very helpful in terms of giving the Jamaican government help with logistics, technology, satellites. Yeah, spy planes. I know they were flying around. Yeah, there were spy planes and feeding information. And so eventually it was a month long search for for Duddis Coke. It was a big manhunt. And eventually they found him with a popular Jamaican minister and he was wearing a woman's wig dressed as a woman driving and they they caught him. 
So I'm kind of, it, it's very interesting why they would target, because the, uh, obviously the CIA and the DEA work with a lot of drug dealers and tolerate and help them with their cocaine or whatever their product they're moving. So, you know, it, it's very interesting to see why they spent so much of an effort to go after Duddis or Christopher Coke. So I'm really not sure why he was a target. Maybe it was to kind of close off the Caribbean uh, route for cocaine. And, you know, because there's obviously the DEA, DEA and CIA were working with the Sinaloa cartel and mm. El Chapo. And there's a lot of connections between the CIA and the, these Mexican cartels who've kind of taken over the distribution angle in the United States for cocaine. And mm. now it's, you know, it's, I guess also through NAFTA and other changes in the American border that it's a lot easier to bring cocaine through Mexico than it is to uh, bring it through Miami, which was the hot point of entry in the late 70s and early 80s for cocaine. But I think today we all know it's probably a lot of it's coming from Mexico and the heroin too. I don't know if the heroin's coming in from uh, Afghanistan through Mexico. Well, they, they do grow. I mean, they grow a, a sufficient amount of heroin in Mexico and in Colombia as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the majority of heroin here is like black tar and that all comes from Mexico or Colombia. Um, so, I mean, yeah, they, they've, they've kind of got a lock, uh, the, the Mexican cartels. And again, yeah, the, the link between El Chapo and the CIA is that's even in the mainstream media. Um, yeah. you know, his, uh, one of his sort of top lieutenants, uh, who was arrested in Chicago, uh, basically said that they, they, he had immunity from the CIA to do whatever he wanted, yeah. including selling drugs and other things, because he was informing, you know, he was feeding them information about, um, you know, the, the Zetas and other other cartels. Um, so I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess my, my whole thing that I, I sort of saw, I mean, in retrospect, obviously at the time, I didn't know very much about, um, you know, Christopher Koch or what was going on, but it, it does, it does sort of fit the pattern of people like, you know, Noriega, we loved him until he kind of exercised a little bit of independence. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and this isn't to defend Noriega at all, but again, he had to get, he had to be, you know, gotten rid of Escobar, Freeway Ricky Ross, same thing. You know, he, he sort of became the, the face of, oh, this is the reason, uh, that, that the drugs are coming in. Whereas like Oliver North is on TV. Uh, still, like every day. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's crazy. And um, I, I think it was Al Miller who wrote a book, and he said that Oliver North was setting the price for for kilos right. in, the, in the 80s because the, the, he had so much control of the drug trade. So, yeah, I think it is. I, I think the war on drugs is, um, is very profitable, and, of course, it's a never-ending war. So not only are you getting money, and, you know, the CIA is able to use a lot of this money for slush funds and to fund their wars like they did in Iran-Contra or in Laos when they were using mm. Air America to ship heroin and then, you know, sending the money through the Nugent Hand Bank to create a, a slush fund. So they don't have to operate under Congress or they can just really do what they want with, with, with their own drug money because I guess drug money is not as – as traceable as you know, as an, if, if if you have you know, Congress decides sure. to fund the Contras to a certain amount. But if you if you really if you want to fund somebody, uh, dirty money, and you know the drug the drug trade is very closely tied to the weapons trade mm. in a lot of uh, third world countries. So it's a, a good way to kind of fund an army or fund a resistance is to use the drug trade. And I think CIA kind of realized what a lot of people realize is that you know drugs aren't going anywhere. So they decided to be, you know, use it to their advantage and use the immunity they have as being a government organization and the, and the power they have to use the drug trade to their political advantage and, and further their political goals. Uh, something that you pointed out, uh, you've pointed out a couple of times in different interviews, uh, another old white guy who hasn't gotten in trouble for this is uh, Mitch McConnell, who, uh, what was the, the, just briefly, because it's just a funny story, and again, it links to a lot of this, but his father-in-law owns yep. a shipping company that had several kilos or of cocaine. I think it was it was, it was a million dollars worth of cocaine. I think it might have been 40, <laughs> 40 kilos, maybe 40 times 30,000, mm. 1.2 million. Yeah. Well, his father is, uh, his father is Chinese. His, 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 his father-in-law is Chinese. His mm. wife is, is, is Chinese. And yeah, it, it is one of those stories that, you, you know, mother Jones covered and you never heard anything about it. Yeah. Again, and the interesting thing is that when you had the Iran Contra hearings, 
the biggest supporter of Bush in the Senate was Mitch McConnell at the time, who's been around there for so long. And he's not only supporting, and he also gets a lot of funding from the coal industry. Yes. So it, it, it's it's still going on. The, you know, mm-hmm. the cocaine is still, and these are the, the the same politicians who are pushing for the toughest drug laws for people who get caught with a gram of cocaine, especially if it's crack. Are the same politicians who are moving in tons of cocaine? Yeah, because they they, they they realize there is profit to be made in selling drugs, but there's also a big profit to be made in locking people up for drugs. Yeah, and there's a profit to be made from guns and the gun trade from drugs. So they're they're making money out of guns, prisons, drugs off it's every angle. The privatization of prisons and these sort yeah, exactly for profit prisons, which are like pretty. Uh, I don't, you know, it's like one of the more evil things that is sort of definitely because it gives you an incentive to to, to lock people up, and that, and that's why you you know America has the highest percentage of uh, incarcerated people in the so called land of the free, mm. and most of these people is for non violent offenses, and most of the violent offenses they don't they don't catch, but they they catch the crackhead with right. uh, with, with a half a gram of crack and lock mm. lock them up for four or five years or or, or, or catch. A young black man who can't find a job, so he sells drugs uh, mm-hmm. to, to to people who want drugs, and locks him up for you know fifteen twenty years. Mm. Well, yeah, and I, I mean, and again, that was uh, you know sort of uh, my point with uh, with Christopher Coke getting locked up is again, it's a scary black guy, uh, right? Exactly, who's and I, portrayed as the biggest cocaine trafficker in the Caribbean. Well, I, it, 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 the war on drugs is a symbolic war. So you you want people feeling like your government is fighting against drugs. So mm-hmm. like I think it was one thing where, where George Bush held up the cocaine that he said he was bought right around the corner from the White House. And <laughs> yeah. they actually um, used Barry Seal to kind of make it look like it was the Sandinistas who were fighting the Contras, who were the Sandinistas who were moving into drugs. And they, mm-hmm. were ca- and they caught the Sandinistas – when it was actually the, the Contras and the CIA who were selling all the drugs. So for the war on drugs, it, it, it's all about symbolism. So if you could lock up or kill a Pablo Escobar, and what happened when they, I think it was, you know, they got the Medellin cartel, and then they just started shifting the lines to the Cali cartel. Mm-hmm. So there's always, the, 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 the way it's set up, there's always going to be a drug dealer. The drug dealers are disposable. So uh, Christopher Dutta's coat can go to jail or Manuel Noriega can go to jail or, you know, a freeway Ricky Ross can go to jail or the brother on the corner selling cocaine can go to jail. But the people at the top who move the, the cocaine, who make the most money off it, they stay the same. Oh, and, I know. I mean, just like uh, I always think of the um, the video of George Bush. Uh, it's like a press conference where he's, you know, Noriega is the biggest cocaine <laughs> trafficker in the planet. And, you know, it's it's how can you say that with a straight face? <laughs> right. And, and he has hey, pictures with not. Noriega. Noriega was was his personal asset mm-hmm. in the 70s. And they helped Noriega rise to to power and, and become the president of Panama. And yeah. then, uh, Noriega was very helpful for them during Iran-Contra. Bush is the biggest dr- drug dealer on the planet. <laughs> no. Yeah, definitely, definitely. From and, and, and um, from Laos. Then in the eighties, you not only did you have the uh, cocaine coming in from Nicaragua, but you also had the uh, the heroin in Afghanistan, for sure, which, which was funding the Mujahideen, which is now happening again. So now I'm really not sure where the heroin I- I- is coming from because right now we have a massive heroin epidemic, and for mm. the first time. It's an epidemic that's overproportionately affecting uh, white people because I think when you had the heroin epidemic of the 70s and the crack epidemic of the 80s, they really devastated the black community. But now you're having a, a, a new drug epidemic and they're calling for care and not incarceration because it, yeah, it, yeah, isn't, yeah. it isn't scary black people addicted to drugs and selling drugs. It's white people overdosing. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, it's like Trump talking about heroin and how horrible it is. But, uh, you know, a lot of other, uh, again, you know, right wing white politicians. But, uh, you know, God forbid uh, they ever say something like that about, you know, cocaine or or the black community or or anything like that. Um, yeah, so, no, no, so it's all very interesting. And again, I, I, you know, perfect what you were saying in terms of the the war on drugs is this war of perceptions and and of exactly. Uh, and, and 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 it's kind of almost like um like the war on terror. I mean, there's lots of money to be paid for people to 
to, to who make these guns, who make these weapons. There's a lot of money for the military industrial complex to 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 make off off a war. War is very profitable for certain people, and you know, obviously, very <laughs> devastating for other groups of people. So yeah, the war on drugs has been very profitable for for the right wing, very profitable for the CIA. Has helped the CIA uh, become immensely more powerful and also be more secretive because they don't have to answer to the government. They have their own. Sure. Drug money they could use to, you know, pay for assassins and terrorists and kind of have a, a, a shadow government that is uh, acting with immunity from a- a- any legal repercussions from, from the United States. Mm. Whether Absolutely. it be drug dealing, murders, whatever. Um, well, Casey, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Pierce. And yeah, no, and as I said before in our emails, I'll definitely have to have you back on. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, not only to get more into detail about your book and some of the other, you know, we could we could do a whole podcast on on you know uh, the uh, Bob Marley's death and the sort of strange things going on with that, and uh, we have the uh, uh, what's his Carl Colby, um, you know, and his yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the whole Nazi doctor that uh, uh, looked after Bob Marley uh, yep. when he was sick, uh, which is again very interesting. Um, but I mean, yeah, I'd love to have you on just to talk about uh, again the drug war and the the sort of ever changing things. And yeah, and I, I look kind of put it in, in perspective, especially with uh, Hillary Clinton running and her kind of connections to Mina, Arkansas, and and Dan mm-hmm. Lasseter. Sure, so no, it's, absolutely, it's still yeah, going yeah. on, you know, and, and you still have you know Jeb Bush, I guess, tried to run for president in these southern. So a lot of the stuff that was going on in Jamaica in the 70s is very relevant to what's going on today in the world. And, you know, especially with the Clinton family and the Bush family still being so powerful. Mm, absolutely. Well, uh, Casey, tell everybody where they can go to pick up a copy of your book, Inside the CIA's War in Jamaica. So Amazon is probably the best place. And from I, it's doing very well in the Kindle store. And the great thing about the Kindle store is that you can actually look at all the sources. So I sourced everything because, you know, I don't just want to I want to back up every uh, um, point I make, every accusation, every allegation is is, is mm. backed up. And so from the feedback I've gotten from the, the Kindle is that people, you know, get lost in the sources. So the book's only 200 pages. But if you look at the sources, it's almost like a 2000 page book. Mm. Amazon is probably the best way. I would like to be in more bookstores. So if you have a bookstore you have a relationship for, ask for it there and maybe they'll order some copies. But Amazon is the best inside the CIA's secret war in Jamaica. The book not only deals with uh, Jamaica, but also it goes into the JFK assassination, Watergate, Iran-Contra, and how it relates to Jamaica. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, Casey Gay McCullough, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Pierce. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak my mind and, and uh, let people know about my book. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a little uh, little bonus uh, material here at uh, Porkins Policy Radio because I totally forgot to ask Casey about uh, his. Uh, he's working on an upcoming book uh, that deals with the Boston bombing. And of course, uh, faithful listeners will know that the very first episode of this podcast was all about the Boston bombing. But uh, Casey, quickly, uh, give the listeners a little bit of background as to why you are uh, uh, focusing on the Boston bombing. Well, um, I was uh, born and raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the Boston bombers are from. But so a year and a half, it was actually 9-11, 2011. So 10 years after 9-11, uh, a good friend of mine, Eric Wiseman, was murdered And he had marijuana thrown over all over his body and he had his throat slit and what people would say was kind of like a Al Qaeda thing. And so it turned out that Sarnayev was really good friends with another person, Brendan Mess, who's friends with my brother, that um, the older brother, Tamlin Sarnayev, was good friends with, with, with another person who was murdered at that triple murder. So when he was implicated in the bombing, there became a, a more interest in the case and seeing if how he's been involved. And there's been a, so much shady stuff <laughs> with the FBI changing their stories. And there was another person who was allegedly involved and they went to Florida to interrogate him and they killed him. Mm-hmm. And then there's been all reports that there was another person involved in this triple murder who might still be out there. So mm-hmm. that's m- mostly my interest in it is that I would like to see some closure for my... Um, for my friend's murder and i would like to find out you know what happened but also there's been a history of the kind of boston fbi entrapping uh muslims into acts of terrorism and then 
sweeping down when it was actually them who provided the plans of and course. the means yeah. for, and the for these terrorist acts. Yeah. Yeah. So there, and there's a, there's a long history of that going on in Boston that has happened to, you know, at least five, six people. So uh, it's interesting to see how that kind of connects with uh, Tamerlan and his, you know, connections to the CIA and his his uh, uncle who worked for Halliburton Bruce and Lord. USAID, which is a, a CIA front. So it's going to be an interesting book. It's going to be uh, different. It's going to be more personal and... I I don't know if I'll be able to solve it, but I, I'll definitely be able to put a lot of things into context and provide a lot of information and backstory onto the murders and as well as other murders in Cambridge. There was another murder of a uh, of uh, a student of mine, uh, someone I used to teach at at Harvard, where two Harvard students set up uh, set up my student to get robbed by one of their boyfriends, and he wound up being killed at Harvard. So I think the title of my book will be The Marijuana Murder Memoirs. Mm. So, you know, you got two interesting, drastically different cases where people were killed involving marijuana. I mean, and, and, and in the case of of my friend, they said it was a robbery, but there was a, a pound and a half of marijuana sprinkled all over their bodies, which seems, and their, their throat <laughs> slit and what people said was Al-Qaeda, Daniel Pearl style, and then $5,000 and cash left in plain sight and forty thousand dollars of marijuana left in plain sight. So it's very interesting to see how people would see this as a robbery when there's you know, <laughs> if you're gonna rob someone, you're you are you are not gonna leave five thousand dollars and forty thousand dollars worth of marijuana. You're gonna take that too. So there's obviously some other motivation into it. I've I've had I've heard some reports that some marijuana was taken, but they left some. I don't it's a very, very weird and puzzling case. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and uh, I I think we even mentioned that back uh, on episode one of the podcast. But I know uh, that was always one of the more sort of odd um, circumstances or stories surrounding the Sarnayev brothers, and particularly the older one, uh, T- uh, Tamerlan. Uh, and right, and um, so, and 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 for his case for the the younger one, Johar, the defense really wanted to make that case. The, the murder case, part of their defense of t- to show that Zohar was kind of intimidated and fearful of mm. of his older brother. But the prosecution and the judge didn't let it co- even come into the case, which is very interesting. Very interesting. So mm. we'll see. And it, yeah. And uh, we'll definitely have to have you on to just talk about all uh, talk about this because uh, uh, the the uh, I we you know I I've been meaning to do something again on the Boston bombing and it's sort of. You know, uh, I, I sort of stopped, but that is a case that has really not been looked at with the, the level of scrutiny that it, it truly does deserve. So, uh, Casey Game McCullough, we're going to have to have you back on uh, to talk about that. So, uh, uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Pierce. Thank you for having me. Okay, everybody. So, that was our conversation with Casey Game McCullough. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to hear some more of my work, then please go to PorkinsPolicyReview.com. There, of course, you can find all of the episodes free for download, and you can follow my work through the email blast or through RSS feeds. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Porkins Policy, and you can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is YouTube.com forward slash 1138Porkins. And I have uh, just a, a couple quick updates. Uh, I know that uh, it's been quite a while since we had an episode of Porkins' Great Game, but there is a brand new episode up right now. It's one that uh, Christoph and I really enjoyed recording. Uh, we we talk about uh, a whole bunch of different really fascinating topics, including the uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh four-day war, which just happened, a lot about uh, Russia-Turkey spy games, uh, Fethullah Gulen, who is uh, alive and well, or, or at least a lot. I don't know if he's doing well, <laughs> uh, and a lot more, including the Panama Papers, uh, Omar al Shashani, and, and a bunch more things. Uh, there is, of course, also my second conversation with Stephen Singular dealing with the O.J. Simpson trial, and I know that uh, people really enjoyed the first conversation, and if you liked the first one, you're going to love the second one, because Stephen and I get into a lot more detail about the case, and we really dive into a, a couple really interesting uh, moments of the case and, and key bits and pieces of evidence. So definitely check that out if you have not already. I uh, also wanted to say that the uh, CIA in Hollywood season two will be uh, coming out relatively soon. Uh, I know I keep saying that, but Tom and I only have one more episode to record before we will start releasing the episodes. So uh, we're looking at hopefully, uh, I don't know, two to three weeks until you'll actually start seeing the episodes released on a weekly basis. So definitely check out for that. And also to say that uh, Christoph and I will be starting 
uh, it probably will be a Patreon for Porkins Great Game. So that's an easy way for people to donate money. Uh, Christoph and I get a lot of uh, requests about how they can donate. So we're looking into Patreon. And uh, I'm looking into uh, also starting a Patreon for por- uh, for Porkins Policy Radio. That's a bit of a mouthful. So uh, I would love to hear feedback from the uh, listeners and the audience if uh, they think this is a good idea, if they think it's a crazy idea, if I should just do a PayPal donation. But uh, Patreon seems like a very easy and uh, efficient way to get people, you know, and you can donate on a monthly basis, you can donate once, you can donate however much money you want. So I'm looking into doing that, and I'm looking into expanding the whole website and the podcast, so I think that's a great way to do that. And I also uh, want to say that there is a writing project that I am involved with. Uh, I can't say too much about it right now, but just to say that it involves a lot of people you know, some people you don't know, but will be quite interested in, and uh, it, it's a really exciting um project. Uh, And uh, once I have a little bit more information on that, I will definitely be talking about that on the podcast. And uh, one last quick thing, I will be talking with Steven Singular again, because the brand new updated version of Legacy of Deception is now out and available at the Kindle store. So definitely look out for that. I'll be having Steven on and it won't be a I don't know if it'll be like a full podcast. It might be just sort of a, a little extra for all the listeners out there, but we will be talking about the updated version of Legacy of Deception and uh, why Steven is releasing it now. So uh, anyway, on that note, I will be talking to you very soon. Bye.